all stand and sing page 82. Page 82. This will be all for Tor Him, page 82. <laughs> Shepherds kept their watching for silent flocks by night. Behold, throughout the heaven there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. That Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds cried and trembled while low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. birth. Go tell it on the mountain. Down in a lowly manger, the humble Christ was born, and God sent a salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. That Jesus Christ is born. Today we've come now to celebrate the two two events in in our church. And as I told you at the very beginning, I think that the uh, the incarnation, the word incarnation, which means to be enveloped in a body. It means, because carnation comes from, incarnation comes from a Greek word, uh, or no, the Latin word, that means, uh, that means flesh. If you go to a Methodist, a Methodist, man, I'm looking up here. If you go to a Mexican uh, restaurant to eat, and you look at the, at only on the uh, uh, menu, there will be a dish that is something has the word carne in it. That's, it's a body. That's what it means. It's a body. And there's been some good as cow bodies and, and uh, pig bodies and chicken bodies that have been uh, uh, sliced up and fixed for, for to us to eat. But it indicates to me a connection between these two uh, ordinances that we have. And these are the only two ordinances that we have in the, in the church. This body indicates that the rising and re or the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. The one at Christmas time is the body that Mary took, uh, took into her bosom and fed for the first time. That's what it means, the incarnation. Jesus came into a body, and that body he grew, used to grow into a full-grown man who went through all the troubles that we have. Now, if you don't think he went through troubles, we know one incident in his days when he was a, almost a teenager, not quite, but they were celebrating it. And he was, went down to Jerusalem and he got lost in a crowd uh, from, from Mary and Joseph. And then they started home thinking that he was in the crowd of people that they were walking with. 
and got lost. That's, he, he was just like us, just like us. And when they found him, he said to them, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? Didn't you know I'd be here in the temple? My father up there had me in the temple. My father down here was looking for me. This father down here, though, that's a different story. He had nothing to do with the body of Jesus Christ. I heard, heard uh, the, the, the uh, president of uh, Southern Baptist Seminary in Kentucky uh, preaching the other day about this, and it, it was something I just never had known on me. I told some of you about it earlier. The only DNA in, 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 uh, in Jesus' body was Mary's DNA. The only human DNA was that came from her. The only person unique is Jesus in that way. Now, what about the Lord's Supper? Listen to me as I read it, or you read along with me, and I'll not read it again at the beginning of the supper. And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sendeth forth two, two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say, to, say ye to the goodman of the house, The master saith, Where is the guest chamber? where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared, there make ready for us. And his disciples went forth, came into the city, and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready for the Passover. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve, and as they ate, they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, one of you which eateth with me and shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and say to him, <coughs> unto him, one by one, is it I? And another said, is it I? And he answered and said unto them, it is one of the twelve that dippeth, dippeth with me in the dish. The son of man indeed goeth as it is written, but woe to that man by whom, uh, oh, excuse me, the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and brake it and gave to them and said, Take eat, this is my body. Remember that, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the spirit, vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Just as when we sing our final hymn today, we will go out into our homes, into our towns, into our cities into our country, into the world. We are here with one common thing, and that is Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper this year is occurring on January 1st. That'll happen in 11 years again. There'll be Christmas and, do, and New Year's Day will we'll be on the same, on Sunday. So when Jimmy, Jimmy has been here 10 years, y'all put this same burden on him, all right? I'm just saying that. But I don't think that it's, it may be an oddity, but I don't think that it's, it's uh, anything more befitting. Because you see, the Lord's Supper has a great deal to do with new beginnings. It has a lot to do with new beginnings, just as Bethlehem has a lot to do with new beginnings. And I say new, not 
to have a redundancy, but to accentuate the fact that we are not beginning the same song just using the second verse as we partake of this supper. The first partaking of the time in, is the time of the new of a new birth. We actually inculcate what Jesus did when we take the bread. We begin to see the cross in its, all of its reality. That he was killed in a horrible way. And we take that body. And we have made it, or Jesus took that body. And he has made it into something special for us. And that is the bread that we will bless before we pass it to you. Bless it, not that it will become the body of Christ, actually, but it will become, again, a renewal of what we know of that Jesus did with his body here. We're going to drink the juice in just a few moments, which is the wine of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. When a person salvation comes his entire life changes because he has trust trusted in Jesus Christ not only the his eternal destiny but his life on earth drastically changes too it's different after you're a Christian we use that in different ways I know you t I told you about, about an experience in Tarrytown, Georgia, where a young man professed Christ as his Savior, and his bus driver was a member of the church. And at the end of the church, we, the, we would stand in the back, and they would come by, and they, they, they would express the fact that they were glad that he accepted Christ as Savior and pass on out the door. This, this bus driver, that, that boy drove, that boy rode, to school with, came by, took that young boy's hand, and he said, You're gonna, you, you are a Christian now, aren't you? He said, Yes, sir, I believe in Jesus Christ. And he said, Then that means you're going to behave on the bus too, doesn't it? Not necessarily. But he said, Yes, sir. I don't know whether he changed or ever changed or not. But I do know that he did more than change his life for driving, for riding on a school bus. A lot's more. He did an important thing. We have, whenever we become a Christian, new desires. We have a new direction. We have a new dynamic that drives our lives. And these results and these result into a listen to the words I use. These result in a life of joy and of peace and of newness. A lifestyle that radically differs from what we were. D.L. Moody, who was one of the greatest evangelists that we had in the United States, have ever had but who was it like the Billy Graham of his day, be, it described his outlook after his conversion. And I have it written down, and I want to read that to you because I think it described mine and probably some of you and maybe all of you. He said, I remember the morning on which I came out of my room after I first trusted Christ. I thought the old sun a good deal brighter than it had ever before, than it was ever before. I thought it was just smiling upon me. And as I walked out upon Boston Common and heard the birds singing in the trees, I thought they were all singing a song for me. It seemed that I was in love with all of God's creation. I had not a bitter feeling against any man, and I was ready to take all men into my heart. 
If a man has not had the love of God shed abroad in his heart, he has never been regenerated. And this new outlook that comes to us, I think, is, the, is right out of one account in Scripture. And it's this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. A new creature. Old things have passed away. And all things have become new. I think we find ourselves in a different world because we view the world differently. We view it as God's creation. We view, we view every person as God's creation. We see us differently. We see people differently. And this is something that was brought about by the shedding of blood and the breaking of the body. What gets me this Christmas is that that little baby boy grow, uh, grew up to be a grown man and he gave up his existence in heaven for 33 years and came to earth and became a baby boy with a body just like yours and just like mine. I've marveled at this ever since all in all my ministry. First time I ever said this was down at Dixie, Georgia in my first pastorate. If I had have, if Jesus had C plus uh, C positive blood, and I could have been there, they could have hooked me up to Jesus and saved his life. I want you to think it's just that human that he is. You and I have a body just like the one that Jesus had, and he came from heaven took on a body, and grew up with all the, the things that these boys and girls that are here today grew up, are growing up right now. Just like it. And then he gave it on the cross. This is a symbol for you and me. Kind of looks like a casket up here, doesn't it? Kind of, with that fat, with that over it. You and, I, you and I are going to partake of that blood and that wine in just a little bit. And we need to recognize that was the incarnate blood, that was the incarnate body of Jesus Christ that came into that, that came as a baby, that lived as a boy, that grew into a man, a carpenter. And he worked with his daddy in the carpenter shop. He learned the trade of carpentry. And that's another symbol that I've used here at this church before about this thing here. He created a table that has lived for 2,000 years. This table. This table. In his by daddy's shop, all of those have rotted. But this one lives on. You and I must recognize that the virgin birth of Jesus Christ is true. Each time we take this Lord's Supper, we realize that we can begin all over again. We are not perfect. The only perfect one is Jesus Christ in this that has ever lived is Jesus Christ. And we're not perfect, but I'm going to tell you something. When we think a thought that we ought to, not to think, we say a word that slays another person's reputation or slays his feelings and makes, puts him in the drags, or whenever we find ourselves overtly committing the sin that's in our minds, we 
know because of this body that we can begin again. How do we know that? Because Jesus began again. And the glory of this new year is that we realize the promise of life extends beyond our present day. Because Jesus left heaven, he came to earth, he lived 33 years, he went back to heaven, and the end of the story is not over right there. The end of the story is over when he comes again. We have the assurance of all of that because of the manger and this table that, stand, that stands before me. We've sinned during the intervening time. You and I have. Let's admit that. We had the Lord's Supper uh, back in October. We've sinned, all of us. But because of that blood and that bread and that body, Jesus lets us start all over again. And in this act of the Lord's Supper, we're not crucifying Jesus all over again. There are some doctrines and some churches who imply seem to imply that. But you and I, instead of instead of uh, uh, crucifying Jesus all over again, we believe that he died once for all. He died once for all. And in the tiny, I want to read that to you that, so you can know. In, in uh, Romans, the seventh chapter, or the sixth chapter, rather, verses 9 and 10, it says this. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But, under, un, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. There's a small Episcopal church in the mountains of North Carolina at Glendale Springs. Uh, and in that Episcopal church, <clears throat> there, is, there, is, there is a picture, there are frescoes all around it. And so it's called the Church of the Frescoes. You and I have a fresco around here, and you can see the beginning when Jesus started, was born, and you can see him teaching the Sermon on the Mount, and you can see him back all in these pictures in these walls around here. And you get to this one right over yonder. And it shows he came out of the grave. Or was crucified, rather. And right here, he came out of the grave. There's an angel pointing to the bench where his body was laid. And there's no body there. Nothing there. Nothing at all. And then you see his resurrection in this picture. That man right yonder put these pictures in this wall, in this church. But that is that church in, in, in North Carolina had them on the wall, had the pictures that they have on the wall. And there is one that is in one picture of the Lord's Supper. And uh, I don't think we have that picture on our wall unless it's the one right back there in the back above uh uh, Beck, Beck's head is that is that the Lord's Supper? It's not. Anyway, this church has a picture that was drawn by a very famous artist, and he portrayed everything in detail. He was able to do that at the Lord's Supper, and he had Jesus in the middle. There's the six disciples on this side and six disciples on this side, but right in front of the table. He did something different. He put an empty stool and put that stool right in front of Jesus. Why, you say, would he put an empty stool? Because that's where you sit. 
you came to Jesus. You took that stool. When we come to this Lord's Supper, if you keep that picture in your mind, that stool in front of that picture, you will know what Christianity is all about. It's all about the incarnation of a little baby boy whose body grew up into a child and then grew up into the Son of God amongst us who died, who rose again, and will be coming again for those who believe.